Thank you. Good. Very okay. good. So yes. our first speaker is Weiwei Jie from Michigan State University. And as I said, Weiwei has, uh, has joined us and helped us run the school for uh, several years now. It's a pleasure to have you back. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. JP, thank you so much for inviting me. And if I thank you. <laughs> okay, so um, I am Wei Wei Xie. I came from uh, Michigan State University and I am a chemistry professor. So um, today I, I just bring how we synthesize the materials and how we use the pressure to discover the new words about the quantum materials. Um, if you have any questions about any techniques, and you are very welcome to ask. And if you are very shy to ask right now, don't worry, you can send me email. Okay, and uh, um, we are very open to collaborate. Um, so, okay, so, because um, our theme is high pressure. So today I will talk about what we have done and what we are doing using the high pressure techniques. Um, my work, so, so the, this is the top outline. I will talk about high pressure single crystal X-ray diffraction and their in-situ studies uh, of the crystal structure. And then after that, I will talk about our high pressure, high temperature synthesis of the new iridates. And then using the flux, okay? And I will talk about how this crazy idea is coming from. And the last one is I will talk about extremely high pressure, high temperature synthesis. And this is the work we've done on the cobalt oxides and the nicolates. Um, okay, so I think we can get started. So, oh, sorry. Um, sorry. Okay. okay, so this is my lab. And uh, okay, this is my high pressure lab for the quantum materials. And we have a on site X ray, single crystal X ray diffractometer to study the high pressure single crystal. Uh, X-ray structures, the crystal structures under extreme high pressure. And uh, so for this diffractometer, it has two sources, silver and molybdenum. And the reason I love two sources is not just because it can use to uh, study the high pressure, and also now we also use the two different uh, sources to mapping the defects of the crystals. So, and also we have the complete DAC loading systems in the lab so students can do the, all the experiment in the lab. And uh, for example, recently we did the studies with Professor, uh, no, Dr. John Michel at Argonne National Lab working on the nicolates, and we can measure the 327, uh, go high as, as 16 GPA, and then for 310, uh, we try to use a new cell and go to the 42 GPA. So, so this is how we study the crystal structures. Just again, I want to emphasize, I'm a chemist. Chemistry people, we want to know the exactly crystal structure very well, and we care about the chemical bondings and the atomic occupancies. So after we get the crystal structure information, and we usually do this like high pressure resistivity studies, and also under the DAC, and so far we cannot do magnetism, and we try to build up this ability capabilities later, but um, we can measure the resistance. And uh, in my lab, we, okay, again, chemistry, um, we always say chemistry made the world, physics try to understand the world. Um, my lab, do the high pressure synthesis, we have two setups. One is this piston type um, high pressure synthesis, and the other one is multi anvil type. So for the piston type, Usually, it cannot go too high pressure. So the highest pressure we can go is 4 GPA and 1,800 degrees Celsius. Um, and however, for multi anvil we can go to 25 GPA and then 2,400 degrees Celsius. So, so but um, since this is the winter school, so I, I don't want to just give a very formal talk. I, I can comment on something. <laughs> so this one, I think it's very easy for students to start because it's very user friendly and now all my students know how to do this high pressure using the piston because um, the manual is very detailed and the, I will say it's called the service is very good and the, 
um, the company called the Depth of the Earth, uh, the, the lady called Tracy, uh, she is the best. Okay, <laughs> I, I really like her. And then every time if we have any issues, she will respond to very details and also she's very responsible. So, so my students always in my lab, they started from this piston type uh, synthesize. And then after they know how to pack the cells and do the experiment, they start moving to the multi embryo type uh, synthesis. Because this is, honestly speaking, this is very powerful and we can do more experiments with this one, but it's also very complicated. And uh, I feel it's not very user friendly, okay? <laughs> so you have to accumulate a lot of experiments before and you can do this synthesis. So today I will talk about the work done by this multi envio synthesis. And for the piston type quick press, we used to use, uh, we, we, we are using this one to synthesize the aluminum nitride, uh, try to get some single crystals from this synthesis. Okay, so first of all, I wanna talk about how we use the high pressure single crystal X-ray diffractometer to study the crystal structure. Um, oh, okay. So, um, okay, so, so, um, so this is the lab-based uh, X-ray diffractometer, and you can see there are two beams, one, two, right? But we don't use it at the same time. We can just uh, switch. And then um, what we usually do is, so this is the cell looks like, and the, the cell we bought is from Easy Lab. Um, yes, so I strongly recommend, if you wanna build up such kind of lab, uh, the high pressure study, I strongly recommend you guys using Easy Lab products. Um, it's very expensive, but um, you know, it works. <laughs> so, so this is, has a very wide angle, um, 120 degree. So it gives a very good data. And um, yes, so this is like how we load the cells. Um, well, here I missed the picture. So this is how we load the cells. And of when we do the high pressure experiment, did you see? So two diamonds, right? And then you cannot just put the sample into the two diamonds. It will crush the diamond, crush your sample. But if we wanna do the single crystal X-ray diffract, diffraction, we want the sample is perfect be there. And then we don't want it breaking, so become the powder, so you cannot get the beautiful reflections. So what you do is you draw a hole of the gasket and then load the sample into it and load some um, some the pressure intermediates. So in the lab, what we did is we, we usually go to 10 GPA. It's because we didn't do gas loading. We just do the ethanol, methanol water, this kind of pressure intermediate. So we usually just go to 10 GPA to do the reaction. Okay, so um, then we put the sample, we put the cell here and collect the data and the data reflection can go to very, um, what we usually get for each pressure, we can, we collect always like 12 hours for one pressure point, and then we can get as many as like 10,000 reflections. So for us to solve the crystal structure very accurately. Okay. And also because, also because I am a chemist, and uh, every time when I saw this pressure, um, this like gasket holders, and then you put like a sample there and also put some pressure intermediate there. So that inspired me. So I talked to my chemistry department colleagues and then I said, if this is working, right? Because for the solid state material, what we study is one material and a pressure media. Can we just put solvents and then chemical molecules into it? And then we don't need to go to extreme high pressure. We lock it, slowly press it to study the polymers and other properties, even the reactions. Can we grow the crystals uh, from this like a deck? And then this idea, my colleague think, oh yeah, my colleague is very supportive. He think, oh, that's a wonderful idea. So we work on study the polymers crystallization under the pressure. And uh, this morning we just uh, got the, um, email said our paper got accepted. So <laughs> that's good. Okay, so this kind of setup, usually we can go to 10 GPA and then 
the liquid nitrogen um, temperature range. Also, um, so the what we did is the circulates that it's like a, um, for the students who just studied, we always go to 600 micrometer, and then the experiment will be easier. But but now we can go to 200. 215 uh, micrometer, so we can go to much higher pressure. Okay, so this is the our high pressure single crystal X-ray diffractometer. Yeah, so this is what I said about this pressure um, gasket and the sample. And from the last year, we add a new things to our system. It's called the external heating duct system. Okay, so what do we do is. Um, why we add this external heating deck system is because um, when we do the synthesis, we people always ask, how do you pick up the temperature, right? So, so every time we tell, especially the chemistry, they ask us, how do you know what's the synthesis temperature? And I was standing there, I said, okay, so to be honest, I don't know. I just <laughs> randomly pick up. If it's not working, pick up a new one. If it's not working, pick up a new one until it's working. So, so but for the high pressure synthesis, is, it's not that easy to do the experiment. If we can have kind of called the rational synthesis and then give some idea or have a little bit sense about when it's the right time and a right temperature to do the synthesis, that will be better. So, so what we set up is this is not a so this is um, helped by my friends at University of Hawaii by Bing Chen. So Professor Bing Chen said, "Well, way well, you don't need to worry about this one is because I was saying maybe laser heating is good, but laser heating is not good because you don't know what's the exactly temperature." So then Bing Chen introduced the system to us. It's called external heating, and you can see we add a the heating elements there, and then uh, vacuum the systems. So if you don't vacuum and you heat it, and we saw the diamonds burn, okay? It's like $5,000, 10 seconds, yes. <laughs> so, okay. So this setup will help us to determine the temperature and the pressure for the phase transition. And here I wanna give you an example. Actually, we, we, we made several experiments successfully, and only this one we just published. So, so for the, because we are also working on quantum materials, I, I wanna give a brief introduction to this magnetic topologic systems. Um, a lot of people study the quantum materials for the uh, topologic properties. And then what they did is they changed the layers of the topologic layers. For some layers, they changed it to the magnetic. So it will have the magnetic layer, topologic layer, magnetic layer, topologic layers. And this system uh, works very well for this called one to two system, but in the trigonal structure type. Um, so I think a lot of you have very familiar with the uh, second superconductor, high TC superconductor system. That's the barium iron to arsenic two system, right? So that's a high TC superconductor. That high TC superconductor is in the tetragonal phase. Okay, so trigonal phase compared to tetragonal phase is very rare. It only comes to the manganese zinc, mag, um, magnesium. So if you have the A, M2, M is the transition metal, X is main group element. And you can see this M, if it's iron, cobalt, nickel, this stuff, they are tetragonal phase. But if it's coming to manganese, manganese 2, uh, zinc, magnesium, it's trigonal phase. So the trigonal phase, so tetragonal phase, you can just simply say, oh, tetragonal phase go to high TC superconductor. And the trigonal phase usually have the topologic properties. And then this trigonal phase only exists in D0, magnesium 2 plus, D5, manganese 2 plus, and zinc or cadmium, and mercury, this is D10. So, okay, so now chemistry, right? Chemistry likes to study the bondings. If you look at the bonding interactions, is iron arsenic, this is tetragonal phase, is a perfect tetrahedral. Okay, but coming to the trigonal phase, no matter it's magnesium, manganese, or zinc, so it's like umbrella. Here, it's either short or longer. But if we study the energy, 
and you will see only coming to this D0, D5, D10, this trigonal structure type has a little bit higher energy than the tetragonal. So, so we can generally say, okay, again, like a very generous say is, in general, tetragonal structure is supposed to be more stable than the trigonal. And very occasionally, the trigonal can be stabilized, and it only works for the D0, D5, D10. So then for the chemistry, oh, yeah, so there is the chemistry intuition comes, right? I was thinking, well, if this is just a little bit energy difference, can we just depress it? And what will happen? Okay, so, oh, sorry. So then we're working on the different systems. Like what I said is if you have the, uh, so if, if you have the, uh, cadmium, cadmium is D10, right? Cadmium two plus is D10. And antimony, just like arsenic, we also did arsenic experiments. So now, okay, um, I wanna be very frankly. <laughs> so what we did is actually we do the high pressure synthesis first. <laughs> so then I wanna test our, this in situ, the external heating X-ray, if that's working or not, to see, to compare the result, to see if it's consistent. So what we did is we load a very small, because we make the European cadmium to arsenic to uh, at the ambient pressure first. And then we loaded a very small amount to 20, uh, like just a small piece of the crystal to the deck and press it to six GPA. And then we start heating slowly because it's not laser. So we can slowly to warm it up and at each temperature point, well, every 50, that's what we did. We take the X-ray um, patterns and see if there is any phase transition. And then we find out around 800 Kelvin, we see the phase transition. So we know, okay, don't go to low temperature. There will be no reaction happens. So, so after that, we go to the six GPA and the heat to the 900 degrees Celsius for this lot of sample, European cadmium two, antimony two. It's around 200 milligram sample. And after that, we get a new phase. We made it from the trigonal phase to the tetragonal phase, one, two, two. Okay, and stabilized at um, ambient pressure. And then we study this new, synthesized the new phase. And we find out it could be a, potentially could be a, a condo insulator. Okay, so this is how we discovered the new materials. Okay, and then I know, well, I prepare your question. Um, if you were asking, say, oh, wait, wait, it's 800 Kelvin, this is 900 degrees Celsius. It's not the same, right? Why do you pick up the 900 degrees Celsius, not just to pick up 800 Kelvin? So. I want to show you another example about how we make the beautiful single crystal samples under the pressure. So here is another example we made is European two, uh, manganese three, uh, magnesium three, bismuth four. Okay, so we did the similar uh, reactions. We loaded the sample and a crucible and put it into the multi anvil and then to heat it up. So, so this is the, the thing. It's actually, we're starting from the one to two, this one to two phase. This is the products we get. It's not one to two anymore, it's three, two, three, four. So if you look at the, what we go to lower temperature first, and we see the new phase, but then this new phase is not crystallizing very well. Okay, and then we heat it up a little bit higher temperature, and then we can get much better crystal but not very perfect crystal. And then we keep heating up to 800 degrees Celsius. And then we get, so it's like uh, you open the, you open the, open the crystal and then the crystal just a drop. It's very beautiful. So this is how we figure out, sometimes the phase transition temperature is not the best temperature for you to get the crystals. Okay. So for this sample, what we find out is, it's, so first of all, once we get the single crystal, we can do the single crystal X-ray diffraction to get the accurate uh, crystal structure. 
and then we find that it becomes a bucked honeycomb structure. Uh, the, the europium 2 plus become the bucked honeycomb. And then, so we do a comparison, okay? So if we look at the sample we measured, so you, you can see this is, we compare, this is 400 degrees Celsius synthesized the sample, the heat capacity, the red one. You see there is a peak, and there is something there, right? It's not very clear. But if you measure the sample we synthesized at 800 degrees Celsius, and did you see the blue line, one peak, another peak. It's very clear, beautiful. So the sample quality much better. So, so then you can also see the 800 one, you can clearly see one transition, two transition. But if you look at the 400 one, you even couldn't see the one, two transitions very clearly. So this is how we modify our synthesized conditions and then to get better crystals and uh, to study the uh, materials better. Okay, so, so, okay. So now I come back to talking about this multi anvil press. So how special it is. So this is the sample we usually to make. So our sample, we put our sample into the, into the sample holder. And it depends on the material you try to make. You need to pick up the different sample holders, okay. And uh, well, so if you want to know the details, um, you're very welcome to, to ask uh, all the details from, from me. I will try my best. I'm still learning, okay, I'm still learning. And then after that, we put into this tungsten carbon qubits and then load it into this press. And then we try to pressurize it. So our starting point is ambient pressure, room temperature. And what we do is we pressurizing it first to our targeted pressure. And usually it spends overnight, okay, we slowly to press it. And after we get our targeted pressure, we will uh, heat it up, okay, to our targeted temperature. And then we will stay there for our targeted time, okay. So, so the good things about this multi anvil system is it's very stable. And uh, we try to synthesize our crystal using three days, and then the system is still very stable. Yeah. So, but the piston type, this quick press, we cannot go that far time. Okay. So, so because I learned all this stuff from the geology at the University of the Columbia University with Professor Dave Walker. So Dave is a geologist. They are not synthesized this artificial like us. They always try to mimic what happens in the earth. So earth not crystallizing in one day or several hours, right? It's in million years. So, okay. So then for this system in the lab, we can go to 25 GPA, 2400 degrees Celsius. The good things about high pressure synthesis is you made everything on a high pressure, high temperature, but you measure everything at ambient pressure. So if, if we are lucky enough to get the room temperature superconductor, I can ship these materials to, to IFAN, to JP, to test, to confirm whether I really made it. <laughs> okay, so, so for the crystal size, if go to the very high pressure, the crystal we always get is small because when we go high pressure, the sample amount we can load is very tiny. And then we always get 0.1 to 0.2 milliliter size crystal, very small. And then if we go to lower pressure, if we are lucky, we can get as large as two milliliters crystals, single crystals. Okay, so here I wanna give an example about a new, new phase we discovered from the strong CM2 iridium O4 under the high pressure. Okay, so we would just talk about a lot of intermetallics. Now we're talking about oxides. And this is also for me to learn, yeah, I'm not expert in oxides. Um, I have, I, every time I go to the meeting, I learn a lot from other person, <laughs> other scientists. So why I am interested in the iridium uh, iridates, especially the strontium-2 iridium-04, it's because this is very similar to the ITC superconductor, lanthanum-2 copper O4, okay? And then lanthanum-2 copper O4, if people doping and study under pressure, some 
for some cases, and the scientists they can get non-centrist metric uh, phase. But however, non-centrist metric phase of the strontium-2 iridium O4 was never being discovered. So then I was thinking, can we try to do it under the pressure? So this is my motivation. And then what we did is we press it at 6 GPA, 1,400 degrees Celsius, and for four hours. And then after we take the small crystals and we did the single crystal diffraction, and we find, okay, after we treated high pressure, high temperature, the inversion center is gone, and then it becomes the non centrist metric structure type. Okay, so, so however, however, um, the crystal size is not big. Okay, the crystal size is not big. If we wanna do more um, careful non centrist metric studies like the SHG, we need a little bit bigger crystal. And also if we wanna study the neutrons and other properties. So we were thinking, how can we make the crystal bigger? Okay, so okay. yeah. That's a question. Yeah. So uh, what was the starting material did you use? Strontium iridate is the starting material. Yes. Powder? Um, yes. And that, and they use the anvil cell to to press it. Yes, and we have an issue here is the oxygen ratio. It may have the oxygen distortion and oxygen. Yeah, it has oxygen distortion. Also, maybe the oxygen is not exactly full. It may be three point something. Yeah. So. Yeah, and then we were thinking, okay, how can we grow the crystal larger? That's a question, but on the other side, okay. Oh, oh yeah, so I would just wanna finish the stories is for the non central symmetric strontium-2 iridium-04, after we synthesize it, we find out um, it still has the Kenti, the ferromagnetic transitions around 80 Kelvin. So if we didn't treat it, the emblem pressure strontium-2 iridium-04, the Kenti, the Kenti temperature is at 220 Kelvin. So it pushes it to much lower after we breaking the inversion center. And it's also an insulator. Okay, so, so, okay. so now where this idea coming from is, I was trying to grow the larger crystal about, uh, of the strontium-2 iridium-04, but it always failed. What we try is extending the, the, the heating temperature or going higher temperature, longer time, uh, longer time, higher temperature, or lower temperature, longer time. It never works. And then my, that time, like my mentor, the Dave, Professor Dave Walker, so he was saying, oh, wait, wait, um, why not? Thinking the things, not like a chemist, could try to think it as a geologist. Okay, for the crystals grows on a high pressure, high temperature, who is the best to grow the crystal on a high temperature, high pressure? That's the nature, right? <laughs> so. So then, the, then he gave me an idea. He said, if you look at the silica O2, there is a glassy transition temperature around 1,200 degrees Celsius. So for the geologist, the earth starts really reacting, cooking. It's about 1,200 degrees Celsius. So then, and then what I did is I was looking at the iridium O2, this amorphous phase the glassy transition temperature is about 900 degrees Celsius. So what we did is, okay, why not add more iridium O2 to serve as the flux? Just like how we Earth has a lot of like a quartz or like silica O2, these kind of compounds, right? So then, okay, so what we did is we add the strontium to iridium O4 with a lot of iridium O2 amorphous phase into it. But instead of growing the large crystal of the strontium-2 iridium-04, we grow very large single crystal of strontium iridium-03, and which is also new structure type. Because at ambient pressure, this is a monoclinic. At five GPA, it becomes the orthorhombic. But what we got is the tetragonal prop sky structure, strontium iridium O3, with a lot of like iridium O2 flux to growth. And then we can solve, so this is the powder comparison. And then we can solve the crystal structure. 
So this is the, if at a relative low pressure, it's orthorhombic, but for us, it's the tetragonal crystal structure. And also, um, theoretical people predicted the strong CM iridium O3, if it's in the um, perovskite structure, the cubic or tetragonal or even orthorhombic perovskite structure, it should be a, param a paramagnetic metal. Okay, this oxide is a metal. So then we measure it. We find out, yes, it's paramagnetic. There is no ferromagnetic canting anymore. And also it's the metal. Okay, it's a metal. So, okay, here, why it's going up a little bit is because there's some like a weak localization in the system. Okay, so then we are trying to doping the irradiated system because again, the goal is try to see if lanthanum can stabilize the uh, non-central symmetric uh, 214. But it turns out, uh, no, instead we can push the lanthanum doping uh, go very far to the strontium-3, iridium-207, this phase. And again, we can go to, like a lanthanum go to 40% on the dust side. If you synthesize at ambient pressure, the maximum you can go is 7% to 10%. But because it's under high pressure, we can push a lot of lanthanum into the system. Okay, so, um, okay, so then, um, that's how we started the, uh, to grow the crystals about iridase. And after that, I am also interested in high TC superconductor, but it's like two years ago, not Nicolas yet. So I, I think if there is a high TC superconductor, iron people already find it, and the copper people already find it. How about cobalt? So, so I, I, I wanted my students to study the, the compound called barium cobalt O3. So this is the crystal structure of the barium cobalt O3. It's the hexagonal, okay? And it's very beautiful. You can see this linear chain. It's of the cobalt O6 linear chain here. So cobalt, cobalt, and oxides, oxides. And the most interesting thing I see here is if you look at the distance between cobalt and cobalt, it's very short. It's only 2.38 angstrom, okay. And then I, if also you look at the oxidation states of cobalt in this system, barium is two plus, oxygen is two minus, and cobalt will be the four plus. And a four plus cobalt is D5, um, the, the electronic configuration. And then this D5 may have some unusual spin states in the system. So, so I asked my students to press it. And then what we got is at six GPA. Okay, so that's also the reason I told you guys I like 1,200 degrees Celsius to do the synthesis. It's because the earth starts react, okay, at 1,200 degrees Celsius. So we choose this temperature and the pressure and we press it. So first of all, we made the barium cobalt O3 at ambient pressure first. So that's a hexagonal structure. And then we press it at a six GPA. It turns out the crystal we got, okay, the small crystal we got, is still the hexagonal phase. But, but, if we solve the crystal structure, we find out the cobalt cobalt distance is much shorter. It's 2.07 angstrom, okay, 2.07 angstrom. And see, it decreased a lot. And then, um, well, then I, I think I taught, taught this jokes a lot. So the first time I measured the magnetic transition and what we saw is a big diamagnetic transition at 140 Kelvin. So I thought I made a high TC superconductor. <laughs> okay, but you know, if you wanna see if you made a high TC superconductor, you have to see the zero resistance, right? So we measured the resistance. Uh, it's not a superconductor. And later, so actually this work is what we done in 2022, the late 2022. So I was so upset. I was like, oh, you are not high TC. I don't want to bother to even write the paper about you. <laughs> but last year, so now it's 2024. Yeah, 2023, the summertime, the, the LK99 come out. And then the LK99 coming out and people said, people said, 
um, they see this like a half limitation, this generation, right? This half limitation. And, and people were very excited. And I, I was wondering if my material also shows that. So yes, it shows that. And then we also took the videos. And we t so then I was like, uh, I, I, I talked to my uh, collaborators. I said, look, we also see the half limitation. So then my, my collaborator said, hey, wait, wait, read the paper. So right now, uh, it's the best time to publish because it's hot. <laughs> so, so we did it. And then we, we, we just submitted to Jax and they accepted. Okay, so meanwhile, at the same time, well, if you ask me, am I happy? Yes, I'm very happy, but also I'm very sad because on the other side, we did a lot of very solid work and we tried to get published and they keep rejecting, rejecting, rejecting. But for this hot topic, and then they just accept very fast. <laughs> so. <laughs> but you, you didn't claim it's a superhero. No, 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 yeah. <laughs> so you've seen this sort of behavior before. Yeah. And what you need to be very careful with is that your magnet actually went to zero field. So in fact, what can happen is on the squid that you have a random field. Yes. Which is opposite to what you think you've applied. Yes. Actually, you have maybe a, a canton antiferromagnetic positive transition, but because the field is opposite to what you think it is, you get a negative reading when in fact it should be positive. So you need to go up. Um, and the way to test that is to put in a, like a palladium sphere, um, which will superconduct. Yes. And if it superconducts and it goes up, then you know your, your field is split. Yeah, I think you're right. So that's the exactly the case for our, our sample. So it's not a diamagnetic insulator. It's like a ferromagnetic or ferrimagnetic insulator. So we, we need to do the neutron diffraction to confirm whether it's ferro or ferry. But it's definitely not diamagnetic or superconductor. So our title is um, Barium Cobalt O3, a ferromagnetic insulator impersonate a superconductor. <laughs> so, yeah, um, that's the story about this barium cobalt O3 at 6 GPA, okay? But did I give up if it's not superconductor at 6 GPA? Uh, I didn't give up. I was wondering, okay, if at 6 GPA, now our cobalt distance go to 2.07 angstrom, so if we press it again harder, what will happen? So we go to 15 GPA and then press it. So what we get is, okay, this is the hexagonal structure type. After we go to very high pressure, 15 GPA, we get this barium cobalt O3 high pressure phase. So now it becomes the tetragonal prop sky structure. Okay, and there is no directly cobalt cobalt distance anymore. It becomes cobalt, oxygen, cobalt, this kind of interactions. So, and after that, we studied their magnetic properties, and it's a ferromagnetic prop, it's a ferromagnetic. The transition temperature is around the 107 Kelvin. But then the interesting thing is it has a large coercivities and also large remnants uh, moments of the cobalt. So, and, but still, it's an insulator. It's not a superconductor or anything else. But then we keep trying to plot the data and we find out there is a weird thing to happen is for this barium cobalt O3 at the low temperature, if we feed the data, it looks like the high spin states. But if we go to the high temperature, it becomes the low spin states. Okay, high spin here, low spin here. So it's, it's very unusual. And then why this is happens and why it's ferromagnetic? Because this cobalt, oxygen cobalt, they are 100 degrees. And then according to this um, good enough theory, right? If it's 180 and it's supposed to be anti-ferromagnetic, but why is ferromagnetic? That's my second question. The last question is why is an insulator? So, so I asked my collaborators, um, Gabby Cotilla at Rutgers Physics Department. I said, hey, Gabby, can you do some calculation for us? 
So he did the calculation, and then he can only explain why it's an insulator. So the reason why it's, it's an insulator is he think this is because of the mode insulator properties shows in this system. But he couldn't explain why it's ferromagnetic from the DFT plus the DMFT calculation. But then he gave me an idea. He said, okay, it could be because after we pressed everything, the distance is so short. It's so short that this Hunt rule still dominates. That's why it's still the um, ferromagnetic. But that also tells the theory people, look, the high pressure phase is a brand new, not brand new, but it's completely different from the what people always do for the ambulance pressure study. And a lot of wave functions need to be modified. Okay. Okay, so coming to my last stories about Nicolates. <laughs> so last year, like around six months ago or seven months ago, and we were talking about a lot of people talking about this uh, superconductivity people absorbed in the Nicolates. And we are also interested. I just want to give you a very brief introduction. So there was a group they claimed, they claimed they see the superconductivity in lanthanum three, nickel two, oxygen, approximately seven, okay, not exactly seven, a superconductivity at 80 Kelvin, okay, above liquid nitrogen, under around 15 GPA, okay, around 15 GPA. So this kind of hot topic, it's very hot, but you know, I am a little nobody, right? And I cannot afford so many manpower materials and resource and money to study it, okay? I don't have that one, but it's so hot. I also want to study it because I'm also curious if that's a real superconductor. So how can we do that? I was like, okay, maybe I should do something, but not exactly the same thing. So what we do is since they claim the superconductivity will come at 15 GPA, but we can synthesize at 15 GPA, right? So if we go to 15 GPA, heat it up, can we stabilize the phase or not? So. So what we did is, okay, actually we, we synthesized a bunch of the samples. And here I just want to talk about the story of the strontium doped because it shows complete opposite properties. So, so why I studied the strontium doped is because, you know, strontium is two plus and the lanthanum is three plus. And uh, if we change the ratio strontium and lanthanum, Actually, you also change the nickel oxidation states. So that's another way to tune the oxidation states. And then my question is, can we make a pure single crystals? Because when people say that the floating dome grows the crystal, always not very homogeneous. And then if we go the high pressure synthesis will be different. That's the question one. Question two is whether we can make it the stable phase at ambient pressure. So stabilize the ambient pressure. And is that still metal or insulator or superconductor? Or if it's not a superconductor, can we still press that one to make it a superconductor? Okay, so we have a lot of questions here. And the things we need to do is try to make it. So we press it at 15 GPA, 1,400 degrees Celsius and for three hours. And we get a very pure single crystals, but it's not very big. It's like 0.1 to 0.2 millimeter. And then we do the X-ray, it's pure single domain. Okay, so first of all, it's not a superconductor. What we made is an insulator. Okay, and then we also, there was a paper to claim if you do the pressure, single crystal X-ray pressure study, and then the angles between the nickel, oxygen, nickel, this angle will become close to 180 degrees. But what we did is we cooling it, okay, we cooling it, and then we find out the, the angles. So, so, you know, if you're cooling the system and then you press the system, you all get the volume decrease. But for the cooling, yeah, so this nickel, oxygen, nickel, the bonding is like bent in more and the volume decrease. But if you press it, the bonding will be, become more straight, but you still have lower volume, okay? So that's kind of weird. And we also studied the resistivity. And then we go to 
the room to, uh, ambulance pressure, it's an uh, insulator. We press, press, press. We are very exciting, okay? Because when we press to 10 to 7 GPA, and we thought, okay, the next one will be superconductor. So because you see the trend is going to insulator slowly to the metal. But then after we go to 30.3, the resistivity going up. I was like, oh, what's going on? So, but then we keep measuring, measuring, we get more and more disappointed because it totally become an insulator. And we repeat the experiment with another crystal, repeat experiment with another crystal, we get the same result. So for the superconductivity, people claim that in the non-doped system, so this is the red line we plot. Okay, so they keep decreasing, decreasing, but for us, we just uh, go up. So um, I think the conclusion is we, the, the superconductivity in Nicholas is very sensitive. Okay, it's not very easy to, to, to repeat or absorb in the doping systems. Yeah, so um, this is my collaborators and all the work is done by my graduate student, Hao Zhe, and then I was benefited from a lot from Suki, Jackie, Wenli, and Bianca. So they teach me a lot about high pressure. I'm still learning all this stuff. And the theory is all coming from Gabby. And then Mingda is helping us to do this high pressure database to try to do the machine learning to predict whether there's new phase or not. And the Shaolin is always help us, he's in my institute, always help us with the measurements. Yeah. Any questions? Thank you. Okay, so we bought the diffractometer from Rigaku. And then this is, you just tell Rigaku we want to do the high pressure measurements. So yes, but the cell we bought is from the Easy Lab. So the setup is very easy. And if you have the Rigaku one, and you want to add the, the high pressure part, and we are very happy to help you to do that. You don't need to do any modification. Yeah, so, so actually all the work is done by my graduate student, Hao Zhe. That time he's only the second year graduate student. I know, well, he's very smart, but you know, how do you expect for a second graduate student? No. <laughs> yes. So yeah, so if you have, if you want to build this up, so yeah, don't, don't hesitate to contact me. Um, so we starting from Easy Lab cell and uh, it works perfect, but later we want to go higher pressure. So, so then we don't have, we do this mini BX90. It works very well. Yeah, so if you have that one, you need a special designer for the sample holder, but we all have this like dimensions and stuff. If you need that one, we can also give you all this stuff. Yes. Back to the synthesis, between the pistons and the multi handle uh, presses, is there a big difference in the volume of material in those? Um, I think there is not big difference. Yeah, similar amount. And I would say the piston one has an advantage to study. Um, so far, my feeling is when we study lithium batteries material, lithium material, it's very good. It's even better than the, the, the one, the multi ambient one. Uh, back to the piston system, when you were talking about it, they use high the apprentice system, uh, uh, like a depth of earth. I know you like to use Mother Nature to uh, tell us some magic. Is there any magic point about 4, uh, 4 gigapascal, just like the 1200 uh, degree C, things like that? Oh, yes, yes, yes. So, but that paper we haven't published yet. Maybe uh, next year I will tell you more. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so that one also very powerful. Yeah, there are a lot of interesting things happens around the 2 to 3 GPA, but we have to be very um, smart to pick up the system. I see. Yes. Uh, and the piston system, we can uh, actually buy it from some merchant? 
Yes, and also I, I would strongly recommend if you want to study the high pressure and uh, for the, a lot of chemistry system, that's, I think that's a better system because the service is very good. And, and if your students have any question, they always respond immediately. And you know, right? So <laughs> that's very good, yeah. So Tracy, she's the best, okay? Yeah. So can you uh, elaborate a little more about the uh, multi anvil press and what are the limitations? What about maintenance and that kind of thing? I mean, it, it always sounds very easy in a talk, you know, you show the results. It's great, but what's the bad side? You know, what's the hard part? Um, okay, so I, I am being very honest. So when I learned the multi anvil, I learned from Dave Walker, and this multi anvil is called Walker type multi anvil. So that's invented by him. So it's like you learn the stuff from the person who invented this machine. It's quite different. And uh, so he basically teach us almost all the details. And even like the high, high temperature, how to stabilize all, all these small things. So I would say it's very tricky to use it, to be honest, if you are not teach or mentored, guided by the expert before. But I was very lucky. After I moved to Michigan State, and then here, Jackie. Jackie is the, well, I will say, she always helped at any time and with this multi anvil system. And, uh, and I will say, if you want to study it, it's better to collaborate with geology first. <laughs> yeah, so this is like my trick. And every time they have the troubleshooting, because like what I said is there are requirements, the experiment requirements is much higher than us. They always want to study what's happened on Earth. So then the heating temperature is much higher, pressure higher, and also the time longer. So they, their machine is, I feel much more robust than us. So every time when I have troubles, they always know what's going on and they're willing to help. So I would say, and I'm very happy to help you guys if you are working on this one. And I cannot answer all the questions, but I will try to help you to do as much as I can if you want to do this pressure. And I know a lot of group has this big bug there, but they don't know how to use it or they cannot maintain it very well. So, so what are the failure modes of do the, do the anvils break? You know, how hard is it to replace them? What's the sort of, you know, each problems that you come across? So I think the biggest issue we had with the multi anvil is, well, is the service. Because service, because, you know, when you do experiment, you cannot expect your experiment always successful. And no matter which students you are doing or post or how many years, even the PI doing the experiment, we always fail, right? But the things make students not afraid of doing experiment is tell them, don't worry, go ahead, do it. If it's broken, you can easily to get replaced. That's what happened to the piston cell. So the piston synthesize is we always break, but then fixing is much easier. And then students were not scared of doing experiment because if they break it, they know there will be a person to help to fix and then buy all these supplies. But for this, multi anvil what we happen is always when you break it just stuck there and then that's very frustrating yeah and then that were her students so students say why should i bother right <laughs> yeah can you talk a little bit if you if you do this about uh, post growth heat treatments or anything like that mm. because I mean, do you really take everything just as it is out of the out of the press and then you're stuck in the other cell crystal, or do you do like you know, oxygen in the other or anything? So, okay, so we, we, sometimes we do. Yes, we do oxygen annealing. And then for the high pressure one, now we always also try to do this, add the potassium chlorine O3 on the side to make sure the oxygen, like have enough oxygen go into the system. So, but I don't know if that's called the post annealing, but the post annealing, sometimes we do. But not too much, yeah. So do you find that, the, that your crystals are unstable when you keep them in ambient uh, pressure? Yes, it's very unstable. 
Because even like uh, we made some samples and then we just uh, try to do the resistivity measurement. And then we need to put the silver pants and heat it to 100 degrees Celsius, it decomposed. Yeah. Yeah, I was just also wondering, you're saying that pressure can also increase if you think that the amount of dopant you can add to the material. Mm. Is that like linear with pressure or is there some sort of like phase transition you have to overcome for the material to allow you to get more dopant? Well, that's a good question. I never thought about that one. Yeah, but, but we will double check this one. Yeah, thank you. Yes? How do you measure pressure? What? How do you measure the pressure? Oh, so we do the calibration. We always do the calibration. And not always, like every one year. <laughs> So then you see the this is the pressure, and then we claim that's what we get. And sometimes we put the bismuth into it to see, okay, we are supposed to mail it or have a phase transition at this pressure. Now we do that and see if it's melted or not. If it's melted and see the crystal structure type and see, oh, well, pretty accurate. <laughs> so that's what. So you use bismuth to calibrate? Yes, we, we still use bismuth to calibrate. You use the bismuth melting point and, and the temperature. So the bismuth phase diagram to calibrate it. Yes. And then, so what about just ambient temperature? You have a force, force pressure calibration, is that? Yes. So you, the press has some force and you, you tune it to some like the tongue, right? One like, ton, and that's, that's supposed to be a certain amount of pressure. Yes, like 200. What is the error bar? Error bar, um, yeah, that's a good question. I think our error bar is like a 290 tons plus minus two, two tons, yes. So that's... In pressure? Yes, in pressure, yes. Yeah. What? Oh, oh, yeah, okay. Well, pressure units. Uh, in pressure units, I guess it's around like, a, I think 0.1 to 0.2 GPA. Okay. Yeah. Yes. So when you are heating a chop, adding temperature, high pressure, so you, the best guy, you, you heat it up. I, I saw how you were crystallizing uh, some stuff. Do you measure the the pressure changes, I guess, as you heat up. Yes, so you are right. So the, if we do the dark experiment, like external heating, we go to 6 GPA, as we heat it up, it's always fluctuated. And sometimes it's even broken. So it's not stable. So we always tune it back. So like, for example, what we did is we increased the, we increased the temperature, right? The pressure change. But we can also tune the pressure. Because it was censored, say, oh, the pressure now is it's not the right pressure you want to go. So we and we can add all a little bit pressure to make it go to that the pressure we want to go. So yeah. Do you, during crystallization of the sample, do you do you cool it, cool it down and then crystallize during cooling? And uh, no. So we cool it down completely and then depressurize it. So so yeah. So we pressurize it and then heat it up. And then we're cooling it, then depressurize it. So heating or cooling always under pressure. So the pressure is always there. Yeah. Okay. Final questions, one more? Wait, wait, have you thought about doing something fun like, you know, post-synthetic modification that you make the legs? So like Paul Atfield, for example, he does like, you know, hydride reductions of high pressure phases after, and he's able to access metastable phases that you wouldn't otherwise be able to. So because he thought about, you know, the new superconducting nickelate under high pressure, but there are also, of course, the nickelates that um, under hydride reduction are superconducting. Yes. So that might be kind of something interesting to to do if, uh, I don't know if you can do that. But. Yeah, so I, 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 wa I always wanted to do that, but I, my knowledge is limited, especially <laughs> about this, uh, like go to the, go to the, like remove the oxygen part, oh. right? So, yeah, I want to collaborate. <laughs> okay. Yes, yes.
Okay. Okay. Thank you.